Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our MHRC seminar this afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicholas Green uh, from the Exercise Science Research Center at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Green has been there since 2013, started as an assistant professor and recently been promoted to associate. Before that, he did his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of South Carolina. Uh, then he did his PhD and completed that in 2010 at Texas A&M University. Uh, then I did a three-year postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Zen Yan at the University of Virginia. Uh, and so it's gonna be exciting to hear him talk about his topic today, which is the development of muscle atrophy, differences by sex and myopathologies. So Dr. Green, please uh, open up your video and your uh, microphone and you can share your screen with us and we can get started. All right. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yep. Thank you, Dr. Hood. Um, it's a real pleasure, um, just honestly, uh, quite an honor to get the opportunity to speak with this seminar in particular today. Um, and part of why I say that is a few months ago when uh, Dr. Hood emailed me asking if I'd be interested in giving this, I took a second, looked at the MHRC website, and I realized something about this seminar. Um, the people that have spoken here, um, it kind of feels like a who's who in muscle biology. Um, you go back some, it looks like one of the original seminars was Bank Saltine. Um, recently, Karen Esser, Charlotte Pierce, Andy Judge, Sri Nair, uh, Jim Carson, many people that um, I just feel honored to even try to be, pretend to be in their league when it comes to this type of research. So the immediate picture in my head, of course, was this image from Wayne's World. Um, that said, I've always got to do this right off the bat. Um, I have to get the thanks in there right away because what you're about to see, um, a lot of data, a lot of exciting studies in my opinion, but what's really made that happen is we've been blessed here with an outstanding uh, group of trainees, collaborators. Um, it's just been an honor in the last seven years at Arkansas to get to work with some of these people. Um, some of the work you're really gonna get to see highlighted today from Dr. Megan Rosa Caldwell, Dr. Jacob Brown, Dave Lee, our current postdoc, Dr. Will Beaver, um, some of our current students, Song Lim, Fran Morena, uh, Lauren Martinez, and Regina Cabrera, um, as well as you see some of our other alumni. Um, <clears throat> but that said, as Dr. Hood mentioned, I did two degrees at South Carolina, and I was lucky enough at that time to really get to know a good friend, um, somebody who's always been special to me, Dr. Tyrone Washington. And we get to work hand in hand, share space with Dr. Washington and his group. Um, and that is just one of those amazing moments in, in your career when you get to keep bringing in people like that. Um, actually to that, uh, dating back to my time at a &M, Texas A&M, uh, I was a lab mate with Dr. Michael Wiggs, who's now at Baylor University and gets to work with us quite a bit on some of these studies that you see, you'll see coming up. Um, so the other side of the thanks is um, our funding sources. We were originally a lab interested more in obesity, insulin resistance, and made a shift into the um, atrophic conditions, most specifically cancer cachexia. Um, but we were able to do that thanks to pilot funding from the Arkansas Bioscience Institute, which we then translated into a couple of NIH awards so far. Um, we've got an R15 that we're finishing up and just in the last few months have started our first R01 award. Um, <clears throat> now to that, I wanted to take a second today um, and just make, give one last piece of thanks. Um, I mentioned that we used to be focused more obesity, insulin resistance. We got the opportunity, thanks to the friendship, collaboration, mentorship, and tissue sharing of one individual, um, 
And I'm not trying to embarrass that person because I know they're on this call, but I just wanted to take the second and thank Dr. Jim Parson for helping us get started. Um, it's an extreme pleasure to get to work with his group and get to talk with them, learn from them all of the time. Um, so I just have to get that one out there and really move on before I uh, <laughs> do get choked up on some of these things. So <clears throat> with that, getting into the science, the big goal that has really come with our lab, here you see me referring to a pre-atrophic signature. Uh, most of the time we do speak primarily about cancer cachexia and I will say pre-cachectic signature. But we want to look at skeletal muscle under these situations where skeletal muscle atrophy is going to happen. We've got a tumor bearing condition, we've got disuse, of some of these other types of situations. And look at that muscle before atrophy sets in. The idea there basically being if we can find the things that are changing in muscle before atrophy occurs, we have a better opportunity to find the instigating mechanisms that may allow for the onset of atrophy and thus be extremely good targets for prevention and reversal of muscle atrophy. There is a significant difficulty to this though, and the way I always like to explain this is out of this work we did with a former master's student, Thomas Blackwell, and collaborating with George Ross at Karolinska, where we did RNA sequencing with a time course of cancer cachexia-induced atrophy using the Lewis lung carcinoma model. And this is one of the first models I'm really gonna focus in on today. The base setup, we've got a PBS sham, treated sham control, and then we allow Lewis lung carcinoma to develop for up to four weeks, where it takes us four weeks really for muscle atrophy to set in. If you look at the right here, comparing four weeks of cancer to PBS in the muscle, all of these red dots represent a differentially expressed gene. Okay, and in this condition, you see that you basically end up with this giant red cluster. There's no way really to delineate. Um, <clears throat> the way I tend to think about that kind of feels like you can just throw a dart about anywhere and we can find a differentially expressed gene and start trying to trace that and if that's important. But we don't know if that's really just an artifact of the atrophy or if that might be um, something that is a mechanism of atrophy. On the flip side, if you look all the way to the left, comparing one week of cancer to PBS, you see here one, two, three down-regulated genes, one up-regulated, four total differentially expressed genes. And somewhere here at the lower numbers here at week two and three weeks of cancer. Essentially what now you have is looking for a bit of a needle in a haystack, trying to locate the genes of interest um, that may be important to your condition but in the concept that if we really want to risk those words cause and effect, cause has to precede effect. We're finding the things that are happening before our final effect that hopefully help us narrow down to those instigating mechanisms. All right. <clears throat> and so today, um, some of the things I really want to kind of get everyone to go home with when, we, when it comes to skeletal muscle atrophy, first off, context matters. Um, and part of what I mean by that, if you don't understand, don't believe this already, I wanna take you home with this idea. What muscle we look at, that matters for our outcomes. The biological sex of our animals, our subjects, our participants, matters big time in what our outcomes are, what our mechanisms are. The stimulus for that muscle atrophy matters for those outcomes. And the final one we're going to get to later in the talk today is that the, the output variables we choose really matter. Um, so what this means for us is first off, the mechanisms of atrophy are going to differ at least by these types of um, aspects, sex, stimulus, the skeletal muscle of choice. Two, when that happens, our approach has to differ. The way we design our therapies, the mechanisms we study, they have to adapt to the condition that we are studying. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know a better way to put this than to say part of what I'm here to do today for all of us in muscle biology is complicate your life. 
to show you that we've got to broaden out, reduce some of the simplification of what we've done in a lot of our research. And one of the examples I always like to start with on this really comes down to muscle protein synthesis in different forms of muscle atrophy. So this is a study out of Jim Fluckey's lab. Um, Dr. Kevin Shimkus did this a couple of years back, looking at hind limb unloading in sprig dolly rats. And you see here the gastroc mass, of course, dropping significantly, probably around a 30, 40% drop in gastroc mass. And when Kevin went, then went and did a measure on muscle protein synthesis using deuterium oxide labeling for 24 hours, you see a corresponding decrease in muscle protein synthesis. All right, that's all well and good. Muscle atrophy corresponds to reduced synthesis. Here work um, about 10 years ago now from Jim Carson's lab, where you see muscle protein synthesis in the APC min mouse and looking at weight stable mice, mildly cachectic mice, all the way out to severely cachectic based on the loss in peak, from peak body weight. And you see, as we get more and more severe with our cachexia, you get more and more of a decrease of muscle protein synthesis out to about this point. And the other thing that uh, Jim White did here was to correlate the gastroc mass to the muscle protein synthesis. And you can see the more that muscle protein synthesis drops, the lower our gastroc mass. That's great. Those are the two models I'm mostly going to look at, cancer cachexia and disuse, given I'm not really going to work with APC men today. But here's a flip side. This is work actually from my PhD I did with Dr. Mats Nielsen, who's now with Mark, Mark Turnipolsky, um, where my interest was, really came down to obesity, insulin resistance in these animals. Um, but Mats was actually really interested in the atrophy set outside of this. So what we've got with the obese sucker rat, we've got lean animals, both sedentary and resistance exercise. And then we've got obese animals, sedentary and resistance exercise. Now this exercise paradigm was short enough. We did not see any change in skeletal muscle mass. Um, we were more concerned with the acute effects here of the exercise. But you see, first off, significantly smaller gastroc mass again, similar to the other studies. Interestingly, these obese animals are about six to 700 gram rats. These lean animals are about 350 to 400. And if you notice, this skeletal muscle mass is not normalized. This is raw mass, all right? So you've got a much larger animal with, yet with much smaller muscles. So now when Mott goes and looks at muscle protein synthesis, here, just an example breaking out where he broke out the red and white heads of the gastrocnemius. And you see, with the obese animal, they're actually already operating at an elevated anabolic rate. Their muscle protein synthesis is up, all right? So when we look at this atrophy phenotype, it cannot be a reduced muscle protein synthesis, at least for the gastro, all right? Now, when we go and put in the exercise component, no real response to exercise in the red gastroc among our lean animals, but a significant induction in muscle protein synthesis with the white gastroc. However, with the obese animal, there is no response, all right? Some of this may well be a ceiling effect, but regardless, you have a lack of response to the anabolic stimulus in these rats. And this is the true definition of anabolic resistance. We provided the anabolic stimulus, but we cannot promote muscle protein anabolism. So that's kind of my general setup. And as we go through the rest of the day, what I'm gonna to try to explore is muscle wear wasting both in tumor bearing and disuse conditions. And for most of this, what I want everyone to kind of key in on are the biological sex, the muscles we've chosen to look at, and then protein and energy metabolism. Muscle protein turnover, I don't think we can avoid in the atrophy field. You've got to have negative protein balance for atrophy to occur. So we are, we're always interested in taking a peek. What is going on with protein synthesis? What is going on with the induction of pro protein degradation cascades? And then kind of the 
what's most near and dear to our lab's heart, mitochondrial quality and health. Um, <clears throat> so the work you're about to see today comes from a few places. Uh, there's four original articles right here that are going to be a lot of the anchor for what I'm about to present. And then we'll also have quite a bit um, to show you today that is not yet published. Hopefully some of the unpublished data will have submitted here in the next few weeks. Um, so first off, just setting up, this is Dr. Jacob Brown. He's now with Holly Van Remen as a postdoc. And this is work that he le was lead author on, um, just exampling our time course model for cancer cachexia. Um, with the LLC model, it takes us about four weeks to see overt skeletal muscle atrophy. And here with CSA distribution, of SDH negative fibers, you see a strong shift towards a lot of small fibers in SDH negative. We're really careful about how we refer to this. Presumably, these are glycolytic fibers, but we have not me measured their glycolytic function. When we look at SDH positive, more oxidative muscle fibers, you do have a little bit of a shift here, but not near to the same extent, showing a preferential um, loss in size of the SDH negative, presumably glycolytic muscle fibers. So this is published work from 2017. Um, what we're, one of the things we've got coming out here, hopefully in the next few weeks, Song Lim is leading the charge in writing of this up. This is in the female mouse. And we've tried with LLC to mimic the same time course that we've been performing with males. So you see the PBS control one and two weeks of cancer development, but then you no longer see the three and four because what happened, we went out to do three and four week uh, tumor bearing states and noticed that we really got two subpopulations that did not really matter as much as far as how long they had had cancer, but were really populations based on the tumor mass. So we have this group that we now have redefined as LT or low tumor, and they have significantly smaller tumors than this other group that we call high T, <clears throat> or HT is on the bottom of the screen there. And you see the large gap here in the tumor masses between those two cohorts. Um, <clears throat> and on the right, I'm just exampling the tibialis anterior mass to show you um, that we are able to induce significant skeletal muscle atrophy in that high T, that high tumor group. And so the next few slides will largely come from Jacob's published work and comparing that alongside the work that Song is getting ready to publish in the female mouse. Um, <clears throat> so this is at working from a reporter that Zing Yan developed while I was a postdoc with him called P Mitotimer. The base idea with P Mitotimer, the fluorescent construct on this mitochondrially targeted uh, fluorescent reporter is susceptible to oxidation. So when it's newly synthesized, it will fluoresce into a green channel. As it becomes damaged and oxidized, it will shift to a red fluorescence. And that marks for us mitochondrial network degeneration. All right, so when we look at that in, out of Jacob's study, you notice at two weeks of the tumor bearing state, there's this increase in the mitotimer red to green ratio, suggesting an increase in mitochondrial network de degeneration that is, of course, preceding skeletal muscle loss that is occurring at four weeks. The other thing we look at in these are these pure red puncta. So you can see the arrow pointing to a couple. I know this three week is very red fiber, but you can also see some of these up here in this two week animal. And when Rihanna Laker and Zen's lab went to validate this measure, one thing she noticed is these pure red puncta, if I were to zoom in on them with a 100x channel, 100x objective, you would see that they are swollen, orbital, and when you look at your classic Z-line mitochondria, they are pinched off to the side. They are not in line with the rest of the network. So Rihanna actually noticed that those pure red puncta co-localize with the autophagosome, with LC3 specifically, suggesting that these pure red puncta where there's an absence of green signal are completely degenerated mitochondria tagged for autophagy. And when we look at that, 
here, essentially number of red puncta in a field, you see a similar increase at two weeks of the tumor bearing state in the mouse. All right, and this led to, of course, significant findings. The Jacobs paper has now actually been cited over a hundred times on this concept. But as we follow this up in the female, what happens, these images are really highlighting what we see. But when we look at this quantitatively, the red to green ratio, you might say that there's a mean increase by the high tumor group, but not much going on there. The number of pure red puncta, there's a small increase in our LT group and an increase to about seven, eight, 10 per field in our high tumor group. You compare that with the 40 per field in the two, three, and four week males. All right. So this leads us to this idea um, that there's something with the with our female mice where they're doing an ex excellent job of protecting mitochondrial network health. Um, so as we look at that from a signaling perspective, trying to come up with what might be going on, one thing here happening with our males that we are pursuing right now, where we have just received the NIF3 knockout mice and we're working on getting some OPA1 transgenics. Um, but you see this reduction in OPA1 protein content at one week of tumor bearing state. All right, for those of you that have worked with these blank tumor models, one week after we inject a can cancer cell suspension, these tumors are not very palpable. Honestly, to find the tumors, we essentially have to um, dissect them out. Yet the muscle OPA1 is at about 50, 40 to 50% down compared to controls and it stays down. The NIP OPA1, of course, being a mitochondrial fusion protein. On the flip side, the NIP3, part of our mitophagy process, is strongly induced at three weeks of the cancer of tumor bearing state and stays elevated as our animals become atrophic. Over here in the females, however, while you may see a mean reduction in OPA1, that is not significant, and you see a similar greater than twofold induction in BNIP3, but only in our high tumor group in the females, where we finally started to observe an increase in those number of red puncta. So these are a couple of the highlights to kind of feature this idea that mitochondrial degeneration does in fact precede atrophy in the tumor bearing animal, at least with Lewis lung carcinoma, but that it seems to be something specific to our male mice. Female mice, something different is occurring in terms of their mechanisms and how they are operating here. All right. So the flip side, I did say we always have to consider muscle protein balance. All right. So Jacob followed up his mitochondrial paper about a year later in JCSM with the study on our male mice for muscle protein imbalance. Uh, Song's coming paper, we should have mitochondrial health, um, protein balance, and some contractile uh, data coming here very shortly. But as we control, as we measure muscle protein synthesis um, using that 24 hour deuterium oxide method that we gained, that uh, Jim Flucky was really instrumental in pioneering back when uh, Dr. Wiggs and I were at AM. Um, <clears throat> You see the reduction in muscle protein synthesis in the gastroc at four weeks. It is trending down at three weeks in the males. This data on the right side is literally hot off the press. Will is actually doing a couple of things just to kind of double check some aspects, mostly in our actual absolute numbers are the functional outcome here. You see, we are very, very confident about. Um, but you see, again, reduced muscle protein synthesis in our cachectic animals, which is statistically significant in that mean reduction, both in two week and low tumor, female tumor bearing mice. So we understand where our muscle protein synthesis is down. Um, trying to chase how that is down. Um, we take a little bit of a different approach, I think, than most labs that study protein synthetic signaling in that while we do commonly measure phosphorylation of P70S6 kinase and 4-EBP1, 
because we're measuring functional protein synthesis, these aren't necessarily always our best measurements in our lab. Partially, that comes down to some of these studies. We don't have the acute stimulus to impact that phosphorylation signaling. We've got these long-term stimuli essentially me measuring what is the new basal condition for these mice. That makes it a little bit harder sometimes to see the phosphorylation status. Two, the phosphorylation of these is primarily about induction, all right? Increased phosphorylation of P70 and 4E to induce muscle protein synthesis. We're looking to see if that's repressed. So occasionally we can just run into a floor effect here. On the flip side, what we have gotten to where we really focus on is the content of RED1 and Deptor. RED1, this is just depicting a, an accepted method mechanism by which RED1 represses mTOR activity. It is readily induced by expression under atrophic conditions, makes the this base expression of it actually a very good marker. Deptor, on the other hand, is a part of the mTOR complex one. When Deptor is bound to mTORC1, mTORC1 function stops. All right. We cannot re stimulate mTORC1 if Deptor is bound to the complex. And so what happens with Deptor, you can regulate that transcriptionally and translationally, but it's also subject to very specific degradation to the SCIF complex. It's one of just a handful of proteins that the SCIF complex will specifically target for degradation. All right. So in our hands, what will happen if we have mTORC repression and thus anabolic repression, we should see induction of RED1 and Deptor, more so probably than we're gonna see the phosphorylation signaling downstream. And in fact, this is what we get. On the left here, Jacob's male mice, you see the induction of Deptor at three weeks of the tumor bearing state, all right? <clears throat> Remember, we do have a mean reduction in protein synthesis and then atrophy here at four weeks. Very similar concept now here in the female mouse where our LT group has a strong induction, strong increase in Deptor protein content. And if Deptor is around again, it should be bound to mTOR, all right? The other side of that um, is RED1. We've not measured RED1 in the male mice. We started actually measuring RED1 uh, with one of Megan Rosa Caldwell's more recent studies. But here you see a very strong induction in RED1 mRNA at just one week of the tumor bearing state in our females. I think honestly, the strong induction of RED1 in the females is hiding the elevation of RED1 mRNA as you look further out into the two-week LT and HT groups. Um, statistically, that is strongly elevated. You're still talking three to four-fold elevation. It's just against the 15-fold, it becomes much more difficult to see. All right, so we've got ideas for mechanisms of mTORC repression and thus the downstream repression on muscle protein synthesis here. And then we can't escape an atrophy examining the ubiquitin proteasome system. On the left, looking at atrogen and MRF, and you see the strong induction in atrogen and MRF in our cachectic animals, but also the induction of MRF in these gastrocnemias. Most of the data so far have been in the gastroc of our three week tumor bearing mice. So shortly before they really become atrophic. All right, <clears throat> on the flip side here, We've added to our repertoire of uh, targets in this cascade, ubiquitin C and GAD45. But you see inductions in ubiquitin C, atrogen, and MRF1 only in our high tumor bearing cachectic female mice. So this is great. This is all well and good. We know from our current, from the studies that we've completed, that mitochondrial degeneration precedes muscle atrophy in the males. It appears that our females are protecting that very well. Um, in Song's study, I hinted earlier, we are getting ready to report some contractile elements in the females. But when we did that original male study, we were not set up for that. Um, so we've got some, a number of outstanding questions, one of which 
is all of this just something about Lewis lung carcinoma? Or are we seeing mechanisms between the sexes with the mitochondrial degeneration that may be conserved across forms of cancer cachexia? And that is what our postdoc, Dr. Will Deaver, is working on right now. He has completed a lot of our base phenotyping. These are all information from the male mice. You see the reduction in plantaris, tibialis anterior weights, no reduction in the oxidative soleus, um, <clears throat> and then increased spleen mass and, and the reduced gonadal fat mass. This is all in the males. He's got females um, going through protocol literally as we speak. So we'll, we'll have more data to report on the females um, here in the coming weeks. Um, so hopefully we're gonna get quite a bit out of that in the very near future. And I do need to thank the MHRC's Chris Perry for helping us get up and running. Uh, we've, we helped him start with any tumor protocol and he's helped us kind of get up and running with the C26. So. Uh, very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> so again, in summary on cachexia, mitochondrial degeneration is a predecessor to muscle atrophy in male tumor bearing mice. On the flip side, the females appear to protect mitochondrial health extremely well. And that disparity suggests that we do in fact have very much sex specific mechanisms of onset in cancer cachexia. We understand where our muscle protein synthesis decrements and our induction in muscle and protein degradation cascades occurs. And we've got coming more direct comparisons between the biological sexes on our metabolic and contractile features in the C26 model. So I've hit you hard and heavy with a lot of data out of cancer cachexia models. Um, <clears throat> but what we have quite literally just published, um, I, guess, I think it came out 13 days ago. I'm pretty sure I saw Megan on the call so she can correct me where I'm wrong um, in JCSM. She's got this following up very soon with work examining mitochondrial aberrations. But this study looking at the time course of development and progression of atrophy with disuse uh, specifically utilizing the hind limb unloading model in mice. All right. So just to kind of orient you to our, to our setup on this, again, another time course. The bars that you cannot see on this current graph are our cage control animals. This graph, um, my, honestly, I pulled out of one of Megan's old graph pads because we typically report our wet weights in table. Um, <clears throat> but what you've got, the blue 24 hours of hind limb unloading, 48, 72, and 168. In, in more common terms, one, two, three, and seven days of hind limb unloading. We label it by the hours because we were extremely careful for exactly how long we left these animals suspended. Um, I'm sure some people had a lot of fun waiting around in the animal room for the next hour to show up so they could suspend the next animal. Um, but here you see at 24 hours of disuse, there is no change in the muscle masses among our male animals. We start to see the significant loss in muscle mass at, 20, at 48 to 72 hours in the male animals. On the flip side, in the female animals, you're seeing a 10, 15% loss in soleus and plantaris masses with just 24 hours of disuse. Now, ultimately by seven days, you're looking at 40% loss in soleus mass in both male and female, 20% plantaris, 20% gastroc in both male and female. All right. So essentially what you've got is an acceleration in the development of skeletal muscle atrophy in our female mice when we look at disuse induced atrophy. Um, <clears throat> And so this is one of the first figures of Megan's new paper looking at muscle protein synthesis. First off, you notice both are in both of these um, figures for the tibialis anterior and the gastroc, the dashed lines are females in cage control conditions. Females do in fact have elevated muscle protein synthetic rates. This has been published in the, in the past. I think it's one of those well published but not necessarily as well known 
phenomena where we do have elevated protein anabolism in females. In, in both groups, you see a strong reduction in muscle protein synthesis as we go on about this use. The most striking reduction in the most muscle protein synthetic rate is here with the tibialis anterior in the female mice, if you notice the slope of that. Again, back to our adapter in red one. This is all gene data at this point. Um, but what you'll notice, EDL, the females, very strong induction of defter in red one. Gastroc, same thing. The soleus, you get this early rise in the females. And as the males actually have onset of measurable atrophy, we see the increase in defter and red one gene expression further tying these mTORC repressors and that anabolic repressors to the actual reduction in muscle protein synthesis in disuse atrophy. Flip side here, looking at classic atrogenes, um, I know I've got ABC and JKL. I'm uh, honestly cherry picking some images from the, fit, from the new paper to the, help highlight some of our data. One, you notice the females again, much stronger induction overall in our classic atrogenes. The males, you get the strong induction of atrogen as they atrophy. Um, <clears throat> so overall, just a stronger and earlier response that we're seeing with females when it comes to muscle protein turnover. Conversely, I got to keep coming back to mitochondrial degeneration, right? That's our bread and butter. That's what we really focus on as a lab. So back to our mitotimer and back to this concept. 24 hours of disuse, you see the increase in this mitotimer red to green ratio in the males. You have a mean increase in the number of red puncta at that point and at 48 hours, a st statistically significant increase in the number of red puncta. Remember, this is 48 to 72 hours to atrophy in the males. So we have, consistent with our Lewis lung carcinoma model, mitochondrial degeneration preceding atrophy in male mice. Okay. Flip side in the females, you notice a flat line through 72 hours. When we get to our seven day time point, 168 hours, you have an increase in that red to green ratio in the mitochondrial degeneration, and you have an increase statistically in the number of red puncta in the females. But again, this is only once the degree of atrophy is quite significant. And so just to kind of example some of what we're seeing, this is the number of red puncta in disuse. You see in the males here around 30, 35 red puncta per field, and that is occurring with or before onset of atrophy. And in the per field here with the females around 8, 10, 12 with severe atrophy. Back to cachexia, 40 red puncta per field, preceding muscle atrophy approximately in the same number range as you see with this use. With the females, again, eight to 10 red puncta per field, approximately the same that you see with this use. All right. <clears throat> and so overall to date, we've got some data coming to try to finish out Megan's next paper. We do really see this impact of mitochondrial degeneration as a predecessor to atrophy, very robust so far in males, whereas the females appear to be protecting their mitochondria. So this, I'm just, again, cherry picking from the forthcoming paper to try to highlight. Um, when you go and you take a full-time course, you do both biological sexes, and in all of these figures, you notice we've got a fast EDL, a mixed gastroc, and a red oxidative soleus. You do all of these different comparisons, you're never going to get perfectly clean data. Um, it's not going to be perfect across the board. But what you notice here, MTIF2 and TUFM are actually initiation and elongation factors. 
they are specific to the mitochondria, specific to translation of the mitochondrial genome, all right? So there's been a long history of studying TFAM as a mitochondrial transcription factor. This is now your next step, looking at initiation and elongation of mitochondrial encoded proteins, okay? And we see strong inductions in the EDL of both MTIF2 and TFAM. Uh, gastroc, a little bit less clear as to what's going on. And if you go look at the soleus, this is reduced in both male and female, but you notice we're essentially getting down to no MTIF2 or TUFM in the males, whereas the females are managing to preserve some degree of expression of these mitochondrial transit translation factors. Going to BNF3, on the top row, you see the gene expression on the bottom row protein. And we have a stronger induction of BNF3 in our females. Um, <clears throat> I hate to put words in Megan's mouth. I hope that I'm not speaking in a way she disagrees with the interpretation of the data. But one of the things I'm looking at is a concept that maybe the females are essentially prioritizing maintenance of mitochondrial health. All right, so they're getting in disuse an accelerated atrophy, but they're protecting mitochondrial health, all right? Are they selectively going after that as opposed to necessarily maintaining mass? So a short summary of what we're seeing here from time course, alterations to muscle protein turnover and mitochondrial health do exhibit specific discrepancies between both biological sex and the muscle phenotype. Similar to cachexia, degenerate mitochondrial degeneration precedes muscle atrophy specifically in the male mouse. And in female mice, we do have an accelerated atrophy, but they are protecting the mitochondrial quality. All right. <clears throat> So I'm gonna give you just a little bit more about these time course studies. And this is one of those moments where you get really proud with how you're bringing in your graduate students. This is Laura Martinez. She's a second year master's student in the lab. Um, in incredibly impressive student. Um, <clears throat> one of the things she got interested in as she started getting around us, um, all the time we got, okay, what's the sex of your animal? What's the stimulus for atrophy? You get really interested in this idea of differential mechanisms between the biological sexes. And so one of the things I told her, okay, bring to me what you, we've got all these studies. We've got time course of atrophy, of cachectic atrophy in male and female. We've got time course of disuse atrophy in male and female. We've got the sample sitting there. Go out, tell me what it, what it is you wanna look at as potential um, sex specific mechanisms. And she impressed me in a similar Zoom call as this when she brings me a couple of gene targets. The first is GRB10. In GRB10, I'm just highlighting a primary function here. You see it in this image working from a feedback loop from mTOR back to the insulin, insulin receptor. But when you consider just the function of GRB10, you are inhibiting insulin mTOR signaling at the head. So that's interesting. As we looked at it, it's not really been studied heavily in muscle atrophies. So cool, this could be interesting. Furthermore, when she looked and found data on GRB10 expression in humans, she saw that there is a sex difference in GRB10 expression in humans. A um, little bit of a flash forward to two slides from now, we don't see that in, in mice. The other she looked at, and I'm pretty sure before I went into share screen, I noticed Andre Bonetto on here. This is data from his lab. <clears throat> she got interested, the other target, Activin Receptor 2B, which this excited me as a PI's mind because GRB10 being relatively understudied carries a little bit more of a technical risk to demonstrate. And Activin Receptor 2B being studied in cachexia, we've got a little bit of a safer bet target here. And so what Andre Bonetto's lab has shown, I believe this was last year in JCSM, Activin Receptor 2B um, inhibition 
was able to preserve tibialis anterior and gastroc mass compared back to sham controls in tumor bearing mice. All right, exciting. What's going on with the with this receptor? What's going on with GRB10? Um, <clears throat> this is data that's hot enough that I actually don't have the complete data set. You know, it's the lack of males here in our disused time course. Um, she got through, performed our study of time course here in Activin 2B and in GRB10. Got this comparison of male female controls out of the way and looked down and said, Dr. Green, I'm out of tech for it. So we're waiting for that to show up as far as I know. Um, maybe some of the current members of the lab can tell me if we've gotten that. Um, but you do see a lack of a basal difference between the sexes here. This is, is from our LLC study. When she looked at the controls from the high lemon loading, same thing. Over here in the cancer cachexia, you do start to see a difference in just how active in receptor 2B gene expression is responding to muscle atrophy between males and females. And down here with GRB10, no difference, again, in the gene expression, at least, between male and female, but we've got a sudden drop in GRB10 gene expression in our females with disuse. That's a little better preserved over here in the females, whereas you get the quick drop here in the males. So really anxious to see what happens as Lauren finishes out this data set and tries to get this one written up. All right. <clears throat> Uh, back to some of Megan's work. Um, so this, more of the I mean, recent publications, this just came out in JP, I believe in December, um, where we've seen all these mitochondrial phenotypes to atrophies. We have now, in this study, applied a couple of different transgenic mice to try and see if we can promote mitochondrial health and preserve or protect to some degree from muscle atrophy induced by disuse. One of those animals being the MCK PGC1 alpha mouse, so muscle specific PGC overexpressor. The other, the mitochondrial catalase mouse. So starting off with PGC, big finding. PGC1 alpha overexpression protects against the induction of atrogenes by disuse muscle atrophy. One little problem. We prevent the induction of atrogenes. We do not prevent or attenuate the atrophy. This is imaging off of muscle cross-sectional area out with an H and E stain. Um, <clears throat> again, honestly, because we've shown our wet weights in table, it's a little bit easier to show you the show you by figure with the CSA, but the wet weights show the exact same thing. All right. <clears throat> That does lead to the question of how. And this image is from work Vitor Lira did when he and I were with Zen Yan <clears throat> a few years back. Um, the primary point of this paper was exercise, and tra exercise training induced um, autophagy. But here in this, in this figure, he's looked at the PGC1 alpha transgenic. And in panel B, you see markings of increased autophagy flux in PGC1 alpha overexpressing mice, increase in LC32, decrease in P62. These are not chloroquine or otherwise lysosomal, lysosomal inhibition treated animals. So the P62 reduction, assuming we don't have a difference in gene expression should tie pretty well to resolution of autophagy and increase in BNF3. And we've seen in some of our prior works, um, work we did back when Megan, David, and Jacob were all uh, young doctor, young graduate students, um, looking at Western diet induced impairments in insulin signaling and mitochondrial health um, and how we could correct that with exercise. We put into that work at data from the PGC1 alpha transgenic mice. And we did see this essentially the same thing that Vitor has got here. And now from Megan's new paper, you see the increase in LC32 in the PGC1 alpha hind limb unloaded animals. These are seven day unloaded, same as our longest time point in the time course study. Males and females, you get that. 
We get the reductions in P62 that you would expect, <clears throat> suggesting that essentially what's going on with the PGC1 alpha mouse is they atrophy just fine, of course, but they rely on autophagic protein degradation over E3 ligase-based protein degradation. All right. <clears throat> so then the other thing, of course, we threw the mitochondrial catalase mouse at this. And this was an animal we were kind of, ex we were excited to work with. We've had trouble for a while now really breeding these very well to get good studies. Um, I don't know why that happens in our, in our hands. We can work with most of our transgenic animals, no problem. Um, but of course, this animal has been reported on multiple times. For me, one of the most notable times I've seen this animal in the literature was worked with uh, Daryl Neufer's lab, where the, this animal was provided a high fat diet and was able to prevent onset of insulin resistance. All right, so exciting. And now we look again at male and female. And we see here what we're set up is to look at percent difference from same genotype cage control. All right, we did this for a reason. We noticed in our cage control animals, our in-cat mice actually already had smaller muscles. So when you try to set up a standard two by two ANOVA type statistical paradigm, we weren't actually able to see the things that seem to be going on. And that is when you look at the MCAT mouse under hind lemon loading compared to cage control, there is significantly less atrophy in several muscles. Similar to the time course, you see 40% reduction in soleus mass with seven days of unloading, 20% with the MCAT mouse, 20% in the plantaris, T of 0.06 is annoying. That's cut approximately half with the MCAT mouse. Same type of thing in the TA. The males, however, no such protection, which for me was exactly the opposite of what I expected based on our time course data. All of our time course data in multiple models, mitochondrial degeneration precedes atrophy in males. What the concept that is working through my head right now is honestly that the females are in this situation where they have placed resources towards protecting the mitochondria. By now providing mitochondrial catalase in this transgenic model, what my best guess is, is that we have actually allowed them to protect their, to put those resources elsewhere. Their mitochondria, at least from an oxidative stress standpoint, have a relative protection by the catalase. And now they can put the efforts they were on mitochondrial health to other things, such as maintenance of skeletal muscle mass. And when we look at the mitotimer red to green ratio, you do see a reduction in that red to green ratio when we highly unload the MCAT mouse. <clears throat> so finally, this is the last data slide I've got for you this afternoon. Um, this is at, this is work Fran Moreno is trying to get it, get wrapped up for us in her first year of her PhD. Uh, we had these animals taken care of, um, the animal project taken care of. So she's come in and taken the bull by the horns, so to speak, and really got carried this forward to get our um, all the signaling and further downstream analyses taken care of. So hopefully Fran will be able to get this one out relatively soon. Um, <clears throat> and what you see here, uh, just highlighting again, we have some degree of protection in the plantaris with this animal. Um, I know Teresa Zimmer's lab has published, I believe, the females with PGC1 alpha book in the past um, and not really seeing protection. I think we have some degree of protection in the plantaris, but not in most other muscles. Regardless, similar to what Megan had under disuse atrophy, we are able to protect against the induction of atrogenes by overexpressing PGC1 alpha. And so some summary from today, first off, Characteristics and mechanisms of skeletal muscle atrophy will depend on the stimulus, the fiber type that we're looking at, and the biological sex. Mitochondrial degeneration does appear to precede muscle atrophy in male mice, both in cachexia and in disuse. 
whereas female mice appear to be putting efforts towards protecting the mitochondrial network. As such, we see that provision of mitochondrial catalase can mitigate, not prevent, but mitigate this use atrophy in female mice. And again, I've seen this in a, in a few papers in the past where we show, hey, we block atrogen induction, we, we've protected atrophy. Go back, let's make sure of wet waste, let's make sure of cross-sectional area, let's make sure of contractile function because we can protect against atrogen induction and not protect against muscle atrophy. So um, I like to wrap up with this picture. This is a pre-pandemic celebration. Most of these time course studies we've done um, bringing Dr. Wiggs up from Texas and doing experiments on about 40 to 50 mice in about a week. Um, so when there's not a global pandemic, <clears throat> we've had the fortune to get to the end of the week, take everyone out for some chicken wings and eventually these glasses start showing up. Don't ask me where that came from. Um, part of what I like about this picture is actually to see Thomas Blackwell. You can tell that he's been through a week of experiments, looking a bit tired there. Um, but some of our group, there's Dr. Washington, Ricky Perry, Jacob Brown. Lynn Brown did his PhD under Dr. Washington, just completed a postdoc with Susan Brooks. Um, I believe I saw David Lee on the call today. Um, didn't get to highlight much of what he's been the first author on. He's done, he did some excellent work here. Uh, really proud of the work he's now doing with Jim White at Duke. Um, Megan Rosa Caldwell here at um, now with Seward Rutko. And I can never thank Dr. Wiggs and Dr. Washington enough. With that said, um, I will be glad to attempt to answer any questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that's great. That's. Uh... Very nice, very informative. And you know what, I like your final illustration here too. I'm looking forward to the time when we can uh, get back to that kind of environment and celebrate <laughs> people's research accomplishments. That'll be uh, a nice day for us here <laughs> in Ontario, that's for sure. Uh, so remind people to uh, please use the Q&A uh, panel to ask your questions. That's how we go about it here. Just type your question in the Q&A panel. And before we get to some of those that are just building up, uh, Nick, I had a couple uh, of questions for you. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me as I looked at the atrogen expression in the two different models, the in the cancer case, it looked like the mRNA for atrogen one only went up at three weeks, and then, but and so I was surprised at that. And then with the disuse, you, it was going up at. 24 hours, which is kind of what Fred Goldberg showed way back in the day when he was, they were discovering atrogen one and in, in disuse. I wondered why it took so long for atrogen to go up in the, in the uh, cachexia model. Any ideas? Um, well, I think largely that ties to when we actually see onset of atrophy, the 24 hour induction of, dis, of atrogenes in disuse if you look at those females, they are atrophying at that point. They are not atrophying until we see our high tumor groups at three and four weeks of tumor development in the cachexia models. Okay, I see, okay. And, and, uh, uh, and then I had a, another question about the, the mitophagy or at least the breakdown. And I wondered if you'd tried, you know, this is a, impressive mitotimer, and I know where you're coming from on this one for sure, um, but I wondered if you'd uh, drawn a parallel with other measures of mitophagy, like biochemical measures using LC3 or um, the LC3 two to one ratio or actual flux measurements. Have you tried that in these? Um, <clears throat> we've done some things with the LC3 ratios, um, and what I've highlighted today um, I'm mostly showing the benefit Uh The two to one rate, LC3 two to one ratios and P62 are in most of our papers. Um, I'm gonna be somewhat careful just because I'm not staring at the papers and you can see just how much data we're generating on some of these studies. I yeah. don't wanna risk foot and mouth on that one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if Megan wants to throw something into the chat to clean, clear up exactly what's happening with those. Um, 
<clears throat> but for the most part, we do see those induced in, in hand. I just want to be somewhat careful to not over. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, no worries. No worries. Uh, let's go not to done the LC3 autofluorescence. We typically do not do the lysosomal in addition just because when you consider how much we're getting out of these animals, we don't want to risk that interfering with um, I've not shown mitochondrial respirations and ROS emissions. We've got the protein synthesis. There's so much else going out of these same animals um, <clears throat> that we try to just stick with the very basic measure so we don't risk upsetting some of our other measurements. No worries. Let me uh, go to the chat. We've got an accumulating number of questions here. <laughs> uh, let me get to those. <clears throat> 